Hey, Quantum Leap fans, this is Miriam Warner, and I want to invite you to join fellow leapers from all over the world at this year's Quantum Leap Convention, LeapCon 96, to be held in Studio City, California, on February 17th and 18th at the Beverly Garlands Holiday Inn. We'll have Q&A sessions with co-executive producer Deborah Pratt, many episode guest stars, including John Aquino and Richard Hurd, directors, writers, and editors, with additional guests anticipated. We're having a charity auction where you can bid on autographed items from Scott and Dean's careers, a dealer's room full of all kinds of neat stuff, and a video room. This is the fifth annual Quantum Leap convention, and they're always great fun, so check your calendars. The cost for LeapCon 96 is $25 per day, but for complete information, give us a call at 805-272-0703 or the numbers on the screen. Scott made it 
so easy for me. And they said, 
Oh, the movie is too long, and uh, it, 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 we don't want so much talk, we want so more scare and less talk. And, and United Artists said, um, we want this movie to be a horror movie, we want to take out some of the chat. And I said, well, the problem with taking out some of the chat is that that's where the plot lies. <laughs> That's where people sort of communicate. That's where all the character construction goes. And one of the things that I promised when we were last gathered here was that besides the horror elements of the movie, there would also be a lot of film noir elements, a lot of character work. And some of that got lost. And I said to United Artists, okay, we have a trade-off here. You have the power to take the movie out of my hand, take all this material out if you want to do so, but obviously you want to keep me on the picture. I will concede that we will do this, the theatrical, but you have to allow me to take it out and put it out on video and a later disc in my version, because that's the only version that I care about. And, uh, that, and uh, they were very kind, they were very good about that, and we then had a major breakthrough, because I, I went to some of the larger distributors of video and later in this country, and said, so please allow me to give you the, the, the director's cut and see whether you don't feel that's a better version to take to your customers. Which means that nine out of every ten videos of that in the world now are the director's cut. Which is great, which is why so many of you have seen the director's cut. By and large, they don't think people do see director's cuts. They see the shorter version. Um, the movie makes more sense, it's more emotional, yeah. it's more connected. It's the story that I intend to tell. And I have to tell you, and I'm sure Scott will say exactly the same thing when he's standing up here, he is in the most frustrating thing in the world. To go out and promote a movie when you know it's 12 minutes shorter than it should be. I mean, when we were taking the movie out, and I can say this now because the movie, we've been through this whole movie line, you know? But um, when we were taking out the movie in, in August, I knew that there was a better version of the movie after that. And that is so damn frustrating, it really is. It's like being in a beauty contest, you know, with, you know, a patch over one eye, and then two on your bottom, I mean, it feels like you're not actually presenting your best face in the world. Um, so that, I hope, explains why, you know, the, the world pressures that. Now, an interesting thing has happened. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the movie was last week was the most rented movie in the country.
was of John's family and his father, and he recreated his father's bar. There's a, there's a whole psychology <laughs> <laughs> going on for that last episode. So there's, there's something else happening that I don't know, but he is Al, Al's dad and Al's bar. Although I think it was called that, I don't know. It was a recreation of his father's bar. No, in the show it was, but I don't remember if his father's bar was called Al's bar. Uh, 
time, NBC was in third place, and they had me, and they had uh, Malcolm, and they had. Um, Jay Cobra. Why are you Oh, I love it. Nobody told me about that. And they had um, what's the English actor? The one. Oh, Robbie. No, 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 no. It was black girl. Oh, um. Uh, <laughs> she was in. 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 She was an English actor, a wonderful actor, and Bruce McGill. Those are the two people who went to NBC, in Bruce, which I find fascinating when they were in third place, they had the gall to ask any of those men to come to the network and read an audition for in a room of about 30 people that you couldn't see because it was in, uh, in Brandon's office at the time, and they had windows in the back of the office in the afternoon, and they were, so they were all silhouettes. They were just like these shadows all around. And in those four guys walked to audition for the role, which I still to this day am shocked that they even, you know, did that. Well, the, story the, that the story that you have to tell is that when you and Dean walked in, and you became there was such connection and such oh, yeah. chemistry, it was hands down, no questions, got me. Well, I didn't know that, but <laughs> <laughs> But you know, Dean walked in at the time smoking cigarettes and just bucked and blowing in my face the whole time. <laughs> and it was, as you know, probably right for Al. So, <laughs> the other actors were being very polite, you know. <laughs> they were considerate, and that's why they lost the role. <laughs> Dean was right in my face, right to the get show. Okay, little trivia, little tidbit. I know you don't. So all of that I get, I just trip. I get small. So it's too too hard.
new clothes and new situation. And then from day two, like, you know, I felt my own stuff like that. It's like, you know, you don't get that. So, so I'd always say, like, yeah, well, is there a disaster? Like, oh, no, it's that. You're learning from me. You're lying. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 after you move people, you go back to the first day, all the time. You're younger people. Wow. Oh. 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 Oh.
that, and that's a wonderful thing about uh, working with an actor and, and having a theory that you go up to somebody and say, yeah, I'm not a man. You're a man. In your mind, what would you do in that situation? And I think that politically, I think that's why race happens, because we as women are taught that we can't defend ourselves. Yes. Um, how did you feel about men and then getting wild? I think what I got the most out of Sam Beckett is, is I think what everybody got out of Sam Beckett, which was an opportunity to play someone who looks at life a little bit differently than most people do these days, in a very unjaded, very honest, very <laughs> naive kind of way, you know, and a guy who says, you know, why can't things be this way? Why can't people be nice to each other? Why can't we just exist and, and not pay attention to, to race or sex or color or any of that stuff and just, you know, hold this in a loving kind of place? Absolutely. <laughs> no, the woman's name will play that.